Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be answering your questions and the theme is putting on your Flow Hive Super. So if you've got questions, put it in the comments below. No such thing as a silly question. We're beginner beekeeping questions today. So chime in, let us know if you've got questions. No such thing as a silly one, don't be shy. And what we're going to do is take the roof off this hive, get in here, have a look at how the frames are going, just a quick look. Make sure they're ready to put the super on top. And I'm going to be taking you through some tips and tricks of what to do to prepare your super before you put it on. So some really important things. So stay tuned. We've got a lot of new beekeepers at the moment. So I uh, hope this is useful. Let us know if you have any questions as we go. Okay, so what I'm doing now is actually just finishing lighting my smoker and uh, I've lit it and I'm just adding a bit more fuel to the top. I've got it on a garbage bin lid here, which is a great thing just in case any embers come out. You don't want to be a fire hazard. Okay. So I'm poking it down like that and now I'm just going to flip the lid over. Bear in mind that after a while this will all get hot. It's not hot yet, but wear your gloves or use your hive tool to manipulate that. Now, I put a bit too much in, so it's almost gone out. What I could do now is flip the lid again, take out some of the stuff, relight it, or I could just let it catch on by puffing it like that. Sometimes it's quicker to relight it, but it looks like we're going to be okay as it takes hold in all the pine needles I've put in here. So, it's a good idea to give the bees a little bit of smoke before you go. At this point you should have your bee veil on and your gloves on if you're new to beekeeping. Now I know this hive is nice and gentle, so I'm comfortable here at the entrance without my gloves and without my bee veil. And ideally you want big uh, puffs of cool smoke coming out. It's just getting going now. I'm smoking my hands because I'm going gloveless to mask my mammal smell so when I'm in the hive working with my hands they're less likely to actually sting me so there we go now we're getting some smoke what I'm going to do this is only a little hive so just a couple of little puffs right in the entrance is all I need to do and I'm going to leave the smoke here so the returning foragers come home and just get a whiff of the smoke and that'll get them into a different mode uh, and uh, out of the mode of defending their hives so that'll be much better when we open the lid because the bees will be calmer to work with. So while we're allowing the bees to settle down, we'll come over here and have a look at our Flow Hive Super. So this is, this is it here and we've assembled it, we've put our, our coat on the outside, we're all ready to go. And now it's just a case of inserting the frames and doing a couple of little things to make sure they're all set up and ready to go for the bees. So the first one I'm going to show you is at the back here, there's a little adjustment screw. So the frames come in a box like this. And all I'm going to do is take that out. Now, when I drop this in, there's a little screw just at the back we need to adjust. So dropping this in, the last ones can be a little bit harder to get in. But if you have a look here, there's a little adjustment screw. I might just move a few of these things out of the way so the camera can get in close. And there's an adjustment screw, right. Okay, where's the little, there it is, <laughs> always looking. It's nice to have one of these caddy boxes that has all of the, uh, the bits and pieces in it. Now here, there's a screw at the back which is made to just wind out a little bit to press the frames in that direction. And I'll show you in a moment why that's important. So you're just winding it out a, a few turns in order to come into contact with the rebate of the, the wood here. So just like that. And if you've done it too much, you'll need to wind it back in again. And that's it. 
uh, there is your adjustment. Now if we come around to the other side, what we see now is a nice flat window and that's why we wanted to push them all forward. I'll give you an example of what happens if one isn't adjusted. You might end up with a gap here like that, which bees can then escape, which is not what you want when you're harvesting honey. You want a nice window like, like that and all of the frames lined up together. So the next thing to do is make sure the frames are pushed into their correct position. So to do that, you need your flow key. And it's a simple case of taking out these caps. So I'm gonna take them all out now. And because the moving parts might have moved in transit, what you need to do is just make sure they're all pushed downwards. And to do that, the key goes in the top slot and you simply just move it to a 90 and job done. So you go along and do that. It's a quick process, but something that's really important to do to make sure all the parts of our flow frame invention are lined up, ready for the bees to connect their wax onto, uh, build the rest of the cell shape and store their honey. That's it here. So that's done. Now those caps can go back in place just like this now we've built in a little design here this little tag which means that if one is open let's say you've been harvesting you've left it open it'll be hard to put the cap in it won't go in all the way but if you've reset it then the cap does go in so that's just a little reminder tag because we found when we were inventing it we would uh, harvest honey and walk away and forget that it was in the cell open position. So that's a great little feature we built in. If you've got questions, put it in the comments. We'll get to answering them. So now the super is all set up and ready to go onto the hive. So the next thing we're going to do is put it on our bee veil and make sure the middle zip's done up, the side zips are done up, and that way, no bees will get in where my face is. Okay, one more little puff of smoke like that. And we're going to take the roof off. And then using our hive tool, the J hive tool, we're just going to use the chisel end to chisel the roof off. The bees will stick this on with their propolis and sometimes it'll be quite stuck. And let's just have a look and see whether the hive is ready for the super. That's a common question we get asked. Now our answer is we want to make sure all of the frames are drawn out with their wax and there's lots of bees in there like this before you put your super on. There's no need to give them extra space to look after if they don't need it yet. Now the queen could be on here because there's no excluder in place. And I'm looking around and I can't see her. But it's a good idea to rest this in such a way that the, the bees could walk back in if the queen was on there. And that way you won't lose your queen. So I'll put that there just like that. And that way a queen could walk back in. Now while we're here, let's just have a quick look in because we can. And it's really interesting to look in and see how the bees are going. We're just checking that all the frames are drawn out. That all of the wax is here. Now, we actually cut some honeycomb from this hive uh, just two days ago. So that'll be interesting to have a look at as well. So we needed a little bit of honeycomb for a cheese platter. And what I'm gonna do is pull out a frame and have a look. Yeah, look at that, that's beautiful. We've got a lot of comb there. This was a swarm that landed on the mango tree and Sophie put it in a box. It was her first swarm catch. And look at that, they're doing well. They've got big areas of brood right out. This is the second frame from the edge and there's brood in that showing lots of young bees 
are going to emerge into the hive ready to work. Up here we've got honey stores around the top, that's also good to see. So that's the difference between honey and brood. So it's beautiful, beautiful to look in and see how the bees are going. So if you have your shelf set up, you can rest the frame on the shelf while you look at another one, which uh, I can show you how to do. I may as well do that now, just for the purposes of the exercise, even though we're only doing a, a very uh, quick inspection and then we're going to be putting our super on. So the way these work is you've, you've got your screw outs here from last time and we're just putting them in position like that. And that way it's ready to go now. They're a bit loose, so I'd normally tighten them up a little bit. But the idea is you can put your frame on here like that and it'll sit there while you inspect the next frame. You can get about three frames on there. Now the next one was of interest because we just cut some comb out of it. We cut a fair bit out of this for our cheese platter. And look, we put it straight back in. And what you'll see is they're starting to draw the comb again. You just around this region here, you'll see the fresh comb they're already making. That's neat. So normally we're waiting for all of the frames to be drawn out before you put the super on. We've gone and cut some out, but the bees are certainly ready for us to put the, the super on top now. So what I'm going to do while you think of your questions is add the super now. So what I'm going to do is put that frame back again, this one here. So we're happy there's a lot of bees in here they've been using all of the frames and soon this hive is going to be bursting with bees and really wanting to get a super on top now a little bit of smoke is a good idea every now and then just to make sure the bees stay calm and also it's a useful tool to get the bees from around the rim here Your bee brush is also a useful tool at this point because you can just brush any remaining bees away. And the next thing to go on top is your queen excluder. Now some people choose to run without an excluder, but we recommend using one in case your queen is the type of queen that likes laying eggs in the flow frames. So here we've just got wooden wax frames in a conventional hive the way it's always been. And what we're doing is adding our queen excluder, which will stop the, uh, the bees from, the queen from getting up through this grid into the top box. Now next, we're going to put our super on top. So we've already prepared our super. You take the window out from this edge because that gives you a good handle to hold it and seizing the moment when there's no bees and there we have it your super is on the bees can now get up and start working this area any questions trace yes Sage. what um question we get asked this one quite a lot what if you add the super too early on to the brood box what will happen so it's only really a problem if you add the super too early in a cold climate because what happens then is the bees have all of this extra space to, to uh, use, but they don't need it yet, and they can't keep as warm. So you want to avoid having extra boxes when the bees don't need it yet in colder climates. If you're in a warm climate like we are, you can go ahead and add it early, and they will just uh, take longer to get up here and start using the flow frames and you're probably on the phone hassling Trace going, why aren't my bees using it? So for that reason, <laughs> we recommend you add your super when the bees are actually ready for another box. They're in the bottom, they've drawn out all of the frames and there's plenty of bees in the hive. 
Now nice. I'm going to show you a little trick. We often get asked, how can I speed up the process of the bees putting their wax and starting to use the flow frames. So one little trick you can do is pull out your frame like this, do it on the window side so you can enjoy watching it, and then get some of the burr comb. If your hive is ready for a super, they would have probably put some, some wax on top of the frame like this. So all I'm going to do is scrape this off. And with my hive tool, you won't damage the frame. I'm just going to mash it into the front like that. And what that does is give them some wax to use and recycle. And you'll pretty quickly see that um, they will recycle that wax uh, and use it to form all the flow frame uh, parts into nice hexagons. And that way you'll get some action on your flow frames a bit sooner. You still won't get honey stores until you've got a lot of bees in your hive and a big nectar flow and the bees can make excess honey and then you can share some too. Right. This might be a good time to ask this question, Seeds. Um, Heaven Chipper asking, what is the difference between burr comb and propolis? Burr comb and propolis. So burr comb is this just a name for comb in the hive that isn't in the frame. They're just using it... Uh, where they've found some extra space and they're putting, they're building comb with their wax. We call that burr comb. Propolis is a glue they make from pine resins, so they'll, or, or resin from any kind of tree really, but they often will choose pine and they will grab that resin, take it back to the hive and uh, make what, they, what we call propolis, which is like a glue to glue all the hive parts together. It's usually dark in color and if you chew on it, it has quite a resinous flavour and it's said to be really good for, for sore throats and things like that and it's often used medicinally in, in all sorts of uh, medicines. Nice. Seeds, so is there ever a problem, um, Happy Bubbles is asking, can you turn the flow key too far like, or does it just stop at a certain point? Okay, great question. I'll show you that now. I'm just going to put this frame back in. We've got our little wax experiment on the window side. When I drop that in, you'll see it in the window there. And sometime soon, you'll see all of the uh, bees coming up to chew on that and recycle that wax. So, to answer your question about whether you can turn the flow key too far, so I'll just move some things out of the way. So, we don't keep tripping over. Okay, so to answer your question about can you turn the flow frame too far, the answer is no. It will just go round and around. So, if you put this flow key in, we've put it in the top slot at the moment because we're wanting to close the frame for the bees to use. It goes to a 90 and that pushes the frame down and then if you go too far, it just goes to there. And you can go around and around if you like. And that's doing its job of just moving all of those frame parts down. And the same would be in the bottom position, you'd be moving the frame parts up. It's often useful to open the frame bit by bit like this because it can be quite tough breaking all the propolis and wax that the bees have used to stick the parts together. So you might just put it in a little ways and turn it and that'll make it a lot easier for you. If you've got a really strong arm, you can go and do the whole lot at once and, and open it, but it is nice just to do it bit by bit. It makes it a lot easier. Okay, so next the inner cover can go on, but have we got any more questions? Yes, yeah, Seeds. Um, can you recycle the wax from the flow frames? So the bees recycle the wax from the flow frames because they will reuse it just like this little experiment we've done here. They will chew all the wax away, they'll use it to bridge all the parts together and the whole process starts again with uh, the bees storing their nectar and producing the honey. Now if you've got wax from your brood frames or perhaps you've been collecting some honeycomb under the lid, you can then use that for different purposes. You might like to melt that down and make some candles with your kids or something like that. Nice. And where do you get bees for your flow hive? So it's a great idea to get your bees locally. 
to where you are and that way you're supporting the local beekeepers who might be selling bees but you're also uh, getting genetics that are used to your area. Now there's different ways you can buy what's called a nucleus which is a starter hive about half the frames that would go in the bottom box, four or five frames in a box with a queen, with stores, uh, honey stores, pollen stores, brood. It's a going little mini hive and you situate that where you want to put your flow hive. Then on a nice warm uh, sunny day you can come and get in your bee suit, get out your smoker, transfer your frames to the bottom box. Don't forget to put the remaining frames in that come with our kit. Look after them and they'll grow. And then when they've filled out all of the frames you can go ahead and put your super on. Other methods to get bees are taking a split or catching a swarm or, a, or what's called a bait hive. And you can also order a package of bees in the mail. So we've got details on how to install bees and do all of these things at thebeekeeper.org. If you want a online course made to take you from square one right through to even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. It's free to try and also a great fundraiser. We've planted uh, over 1.5 million trees now to create billions of blossoms for bees to safely forage on and everything else that needs habitat to make our world go round. Have a look at thebeekeeper.org if you really want an online video course with experts from all over the world training you in beekeeping. Great. Glenn um, wants to ask for a bit of advice. Harvested a few, uh, three super frames yesterday and got a lot of honey. They were all capped off, but had a bit of leakage that ended up going through to the brood box. Um, and then he noticed that all his bees were sort of all on the side and on the outside of the hive. And just wondering if it was, if he'd done something wrong or what was maybe going on. And, you know, I guess with the leaking honey, he, said, he reckons he got just like about a half a cup after three capped... Um, super frames. Half a cup leaked? Or yeah, half? half a cup leaked. Yeah, okay. So uh, bear in mind that conventional beekeeping, which I did for years and years with the hives, selling the honey to the local shops, you're cracking the lids off, there's a lot of comb underneath it usually, you're spilling a lot of honey into the hive and the bees are used to cleaning it up. So bees are really good at cleaning up honey spills inside the hive. So I've never really seen it as a problem. But depending on, way, on the way that the bees have capped the frame, let's say they've got it, it bulged out at the top and in at the bottom, you might get flow dynamics that means some of the honey comes out of the frame and into the hive. It's usually a small amount compared to how much you're harvesting and the bees can just lick it up. Now if you've got your tray in, it'll, it'll, it'll go into the tray. If you've got the uh, classic model with the core flute slider, then you'll... Uh, all you'll do is put the core flute in the top position so any honey goes on top of the core flute and the bees can lick it through the, the mesh. Now, uh, uh, there are some things to check though. If you're getting excess spillage and you're wondering if there's a problem, then first of all, look at the, the level here. Now you can see this isn't right for harvesting. So we're going to need to adjust the front legs to get the level bubble into the center. And if you've got the classic model, then you'll need to make sure the surface you're on is level and we've got the, that three degree slope built into the stand. So all you do to adjust the level is lift the front a little and screw these. You can use a spanner on the bottom, but I often find you can just tilt the hive and spin it out a little bit like this. And I'm going to go ahead and do the other side and then we should have our three degree slope. It's about, uh, about an inch up from the bottom. So we're not quite there yet. You can see that level bubble there now. Just hitting mid. So that is the perfect slope for harvesting honey. The sideways direction is always good to get right as well. So we haven't quite got that right. So we can adjust the sideways level. In this case, I've got to raise this side. So these legs are great because you can just get it perfect, which is fantastic. 
and uh, there we go. Now we've got our bubble in the middle there and there. So our hive is all set up for harvesting. So that's one important check. And the other tip I can give you, if you've been harvesting for a while, then uh, when you finish harvesting, the key goes into the top slot and you turn it. And what that does is push all of the frame parts back. Now, if you're in a hurry and you just go like that and move on, what could happen is the parts close but then bounce back up because there's a lot of wax and propolis. And then you can get a lot of wax that the bees will put in trying to make a cell like that work for them, which they will. So you've got this big blob of wax in the corner joining the parts. And that will impede the flow later. So what we say is when you're closing it, just leave the key like that for a minute or two. And that way all the parts will press down in to position. If you're getting excessive spills, get in touch. We might be able to help you solve your problem. But generally, there's either no spillage or a little bit of spillage when you're harvesting. That's not a problem. The bees will lick it up. Fantastic seeds. Um, what happens to the bees that die, or do they die outside the hive? So they will die outside the hive. And you can see here, there's a, there's a, a dead bee here. Uh, this is actually a young baby bee, this one, a little fluffy baby bee. So what the bees will try and do is take the dead out of the hive and take it as far away as they can. They'll often grab a bee and fly a little ways. They can almost fly with the bee. They can fly in little hops and they'll take the bee as far away as they can. They're the undertakers that are taking out the dead and they do that for disease reasons. Now you have to bear in mind that a hive could have, say, 40,000 bees in it and the bees might only last four or six weeks, so every four to six weeks there's 40,000 bees are turning over and dying. So it's normal to have dead bees at, at the entrance. But if you're getting a carpet of bees, like dead bees forming a thick blanket this long, then you've probably got what's called a pesticide uh, kill, where your bees have foraged on flowers and somebody's sprayed pesticides on them and they, they'll die in the carpet out the front with their tongues hanging out. So if you're seeing a lot, then that could be an issue. But if you're seeing just a few, that's perfectly normal. If you get up early, you can watch them dragging out the, uh, the bees on the landing board. And it's quite interesting to have a look really early in the morning and see what's going on with your hive. Great. Seeds, do you know if you can use the flow frames in a Slovenian hive? Ah, I have uh, done that. Slovenian hives made for a honey house where the, the hives are kind of taking up part of the wall and you're actually taking the frames out sideways. And yes, we have uh, experimented with putting them in one of those hives. So uh, with a bit of uh, work with the guides that hold it all, you could put the flow frames in a Slovenian hive. Right. What's the best way to move the position of your hive from one area of, of the garden to another? So if you're moving a hive a short way, there's two methods. One is you just move it a metre at a time, then the next day move it another metre. And you can probably go about two metres a day by moving it a metre and then maybe in the afternoon another metre and so on. And you can creep the hive across the yard. You might like to use a trolley to do that so you can easily just move it a little bit and you'll notice the foraging bees returning to where the old hive was and then because it's not too far away and there's no other hives there they'll follow the hive to the new position. Now if that's not feasible then you can do what's called a disorientation technique where you just pick up the hive and move it to the new location be it uh, close or far and put a branch in front of the hive. So returning foragers, or, or actually the foragers when they shoot out of the hive will hit the leafy branch in front and go, something's different, something's changed, and they'll reorientate to the new location. It's a great trick, I use it a lot. Sometimes I'll tape a t-shirt around the hive, and what that'll do is, is create that barrier. The bees will come out really enthusiastically, bang into that t-shirt or that foliage, and then 
reorientate. So you 95% of the bees will reorientate to the new spot and only 5% will return to the old spot. Now if you want to put a cardboard box or something in the old spot, you can collect the bees and ferry them to the new hive or you can let them do their own thing and work it out. So that's a, a great tip. Great. So now here's, here's a chance to show everyone the tray. David's saying that he noticed that we don't have any hive beetle traps um, on the frames. Wondering if we get a hive beetles at our, um, in our area. He's in the Maitland, New South Wales area and said they're dealing with a lot of hive beetles at the moment. Look at these beautiful pollen balls. The bees go out to the flowers and electrostatic charges actually help the pollen grains jump right off the flower onto their hairy bo bodies. The bees even have hairy eyeballs and then they scrape all of that pollen back to what we call the pollen basket, which is on their hind leg. They fly back with these big, big uh, balls on their back legs and they go into the hive and they knock that pollen off and ram it into the cells with their heads and then add their enzymes, their special sauce, top it with honey and they ferment it into bee bread. So cool. So that's a returning forager. Now to answer your question about beetles, the, we have a lot of beetles here. We're in a sticky, humid summer and there's a lot at the moment. So great time to activate your pest management tray. So down here in the bottom, we have these wing screws and you can then open up your vented cover and then slide out your beetle tray. And it'd be a good time to put oil in it because I can see beetles already. And actually a, um, a a lot of young larvae that's been damaged by beetles. So thanks for the tip there. We better activate the oil tray here just by pouring some oil in it. And we might show you how to do that. I'll get somebody to go and get some oil and we'll activate this oil tray to help look after this hive. When the colony is weak, good idea to catch some of those beetles. Okay, that's great. Now, Sophie, could you run and get some oil that's in the pantry and, uh, and we'll just show them how to do this. While you're thinking of your questions, um, Trace will read out some questions that have come through. Great. This is a good one, Seeds. Thomas is asking, I see that you set your hive level based on your bubbles, but is it, but is it okay to leave it like that with the three degree tilt? Um, Thomas had read that the bees like it nice and level when they're building their comb. Great question. So in this direction, it doesn't matter if it's level because that's in the plane of the, uh, of the comb. So the, you can have it in whatever tilt you like this way, but sideways it's really important to have it level. So that's why we've built the level into the back, which the, if this level here, gives you a sideways level and that we put that there for when you're building naturally drawn comb you want to make sure the hive is level in the sideways direction as you say but you can tilt it back as far as you like we recommend a three degree slope for your honey harvesting now uh, what we're going to do is show you how to activate this oil tray you can clean it out a bit more it's going to get grungy anyway so you don't have to get it perfectly clean i'm just going to use my bee brush to brush that out now we have our oil tray we can just put a little bit of oil in all of these segments and that will help catch a lot of those hive beetles so a good idea to just use some cheap oil not like this one <laughs> and we're just covering each segment you don't need to fill the tray up and you'll notice you'll get lots of beetles caught in that oil. So we can come back later and have a look at that. Thank you. And a little tip there, when you put your vented cover back in, make sure that it's pressed firm up against, we're gonna go vents up for ventilation, it's a hot time of year. Make sure it's pressed firmly up against the tray so no bees can get up between the vented cover and the tray because we don't want any bees getting stuck now that we've got oil in there because they will die like the beetles do in the oil tray.
Great. So now a couple of questions coming in about um, one was one's about the queen um, ended up laying in the flow frames and they had to clean it out and weren't quite sure what to do. And another um, flow beekeeper's tuned in saying it was their kind of mess up where they messed up by putting um, a brood frame that obviously had the queen and they hadn't spotted the queen and the queen ended up in the flow frame. So the question was, do they just leave the brood to hatch out? Do they clean out the flow frames? How do they, you know, if they can't find the queen, what do they do to sort that problem out? If you end up with a queen laying in your flow frames, which can happen for a few reasons. One is you've accidentally let her get up there above the excluder. Another is she's small when she's uh, just starting out first as her egg layer and she might just slip through that queen excluder. And another could be actually you've got no queen at all and the workers are starting to lay eggs in the flow frame. So what you'll need to do to rectify this is you, you will take your top box off. You'll have a look and make sure that uh, you have um, a laying queen down the bottom. If you've got eggs below the excluder and eggs uh, above the excluder, then have a look down the cells and check whether the eggs are at the bottom of the cell or on the side wall. If they're on the side wall, what you've got is laying workers laying all throughout the hive, including the excluder. And what you'll need to do is actually uh, get another queen or put a frame of brood with eggs on it from another hive so they can raise a new queen. Now, let's assume that you've got a different problem where there's no brood down here but there is brood in the flow frames, I mean laying eggs in the flow frames. The queen somehow got up to the top. That's pretty easy to rectify. All you need to do is move all of the bees down to the bottom and uh, that way the queen will be down there too so you don't even need to find the queen. So to do that, you'll take out the frames and use your bee brush and you'll brush all the bees off into your bottom box. So the, the super will come off like that and you will get the uh, your bee brush out, you take the excluder off and one by one you'll get your flow frames and brush all of the bees off and down into the bottom box. And then you'll put your excluder back on and now you know all of the bees down the bottom including the queen. Worker bees will come up through the excluder again and what will happen in this top box is your brood will be looked after and they'll emerge. It won't damage the flow frames and it won't uh, be a problem for your next honey harvest. All you'll need to do is wait a couple of weeks till all of that brood has emerged. So if there's eggs there, you need to wait uh, 21 days for worker bees and a bit longer for the drones to, to emerge. And But that time you won't have any more eggs or larvae in your flow frames and you can go ahead and harvest. Now I've just taken the box off again, so what I'll need to do is brush the bees away from the edges, or you can use a little smoke, my smoke is still going, just to uh, get the bees away from the edges, and you can go ahead and put on your super again. Seed right. some James is asking, What's the difference between the hybrid flow super and the flow hive two plus super? Okay, so let's just seize this moment to put this back on. I can see I've still got a couple of bees just around this edge here. Good, there we go. So the hybrid is for those who like to collect honeycomb and harvest honey in their super at the same time. We thought it would be really popular, but actually most people prefer the full rack like this. So in, a, in this size box, you'll have three flow frames in the middle and four, flow fra four conventional wooden frames on the edge for the purposes of collecting honeycomb. So a flow hive uh, or flow hive two super, as you say, is just like this with six flow frames or the larger size with seven flow frames in your top box. Great. Now that Megan's asking, 
Um, Megan's been using the diatomaceous earth in the bottom tray uh, for killing the hive beetles. Finds it works really well and not as sort of mucky as the oil. Would you recommend her using that? Uh, the reason why I don't is as soon as it gets wet, it doesn't work anymore. So let's say you've got driving rain coming in the front. It might splash in, go through the screen and down into your tray. And that way you'll get uh, water mixed in with the diatomaceous earth and then it won't work as you say. But if, if you're in a dry climate, you don't get much rain, then it could work really nicely for you. Great. And I guess because then Joel is asking, should you just keep oil in the tray all the time? Uh, you can. We tend to use it when a hives, uh, when you've got a lot of beetles around and y you've also got a weak colony. That's when I tend to activate the oil tray. Another thing you can do is soapy water. That is cleaner than oil. So you can test that out. Soapy water will actually clog the breathing of the beetles and also bees. So you don't want bees to get in there. Make sure your vented cover is pressed tightly up against your tray and I wouldn't use that in the winter time you get a lot of condensation um, coming off that water tray but in the warm times you can go ahead and add uh, soapy water just by squeezing a bit of detergent into your trays so just any old dishwashing detergent like that put some water in there and slide your tray in and that'll be cleaner um, than oil when it goes to cleaning up your tray and uh, let us know how you go if you try that. Right, this is a good, Vanessa had, Vanessa noticed she packed down the flow hive and did a honey harvest actually in the kitchen. Um, all the, the frames were capped but she noticed on a couple of the frames there were parts of the hive, the flow frame that weren't capped and of course that honey didn't go down the channel, it ended up coming on the outside of the flow frames. And I, she, I think she's just letting you know that that's what happened. And maybe that's what happens when people harvest their honey if it's not completely capped. Yeah, I haven't necessarily found that to be the rhyme or reason why some flow frames uh, spill some honey down the outside and, and some don't. Sometimes you can get not capped at all and you'll get uh, no honey spills at all. So it, there's a lot of factors at play. You've got kind of fluid dynamics here where if they've got a lower viscosity honey down the bottom and a higher up the top, then uh, the top's trying to race down, the bottom's moving slow and you can get spills for that reason. Or perhaps um, the bees have collected a bit of thixotropic honey, which flowers like manuka uh, can put in there that would impede honey flow. Um, so there's all sorts of little reasons, but um, as said earlier, the bees will go ahead and clean it up in the hive. If you're worried about it and it's causing you issues, then just harvest a couple of frames and leave the rest for the bees. Come back the next day and harvest some more. And that way you'll quarantine any spills in your hive to a smaller amount. Great. Russell, um, Russell just noticed he put the flow hive together and noticed that when he pushes the little tube into the bottom of the flow frame, it pushes back about a quarter of an inch. He said, he's wondering if it's normal. He said all these screws that he's adjusted, like the ones you did seeds at the start, they are all fitting in nice and snugly. I was wondering if he's doing something wrong or what's going on there. Okay, that is interesting. The only way... Oh. So this is a great on-point question to what we're doing today. We're showing you how to add your super. So if you've adjusted this little screw out at the back here, then that will stop the frame moving backwards when you insert the tube. Now, what you're saying is you've done that and you insert this and it pushes back. Now you will get a little bit of springiness. And what you want to do when you insert the tube is that little tag goes in the bottom and you just wiggle it gently into place. That's it there. But when you let it go, it should form your nice window. In fact, the bees when it's time to harvest, sort of waxed up everything so much you can often get away without adjusting that screw at all and the frame will stay in position for you to put your tube in. Just like that. Let us know how you go. Nice. Now just a couple of things on the oil seeds. I think a few people have tuned in. One of them is what oil do you use in the tray and why are you putting oil in the tray? 
So the pest management tray down the bottom has multiple purposes, but one of them is to catch the hive beetles, which are these annoying little black beetles, which aren't usually a problem in most healthy hives, but when a colony gets weak or it's just starting out, they can lay a whole lot of eggs in your brood frames and thousands of little tiny hive beetle maggots will be uh, worming around damaging your frames and it can be the death of your colony. So that's why we catch the hive beetles. So let's have a look and see if we've caught any yet. We just put some oil in there <laughs> and oh, one bee snuck in there, that's not what we wanted. Um, and so far, okay, there's a beetle. <laughs> I just knocked that one in. So you can <laughs> see it here and it will die because the oil will block up its exoskeleton breathing. All right. Nice. There's, there's another one. So a lot of beetles around at the moment. Good idea to activate your tray. We just put some oil in this one and soon we'll have a bunch of beetles caught in it. Now, a good thing to do though, you notice there was one bee in there, is as you slide the tray back in, especially if you've just been pulling the hive apart, make sure there's no bees up under the screen because they'll be stuck in that area and end up in your oil. Oh, great seeds, because someone was just asking, like people who maybe don't understand how the space works, what sort of separates that tray from the brood box, but you just mentioned the screen that's in there. Yeah, so there's a screen bottom board, which is basically a, a, a piece of metal with a whole lot of uh, grid cuts in it that the bees can't get through, but the beetles can fall through. And you can also use it for counting varroa mites if you've got a sticky board underneath and you'll get some varroa mites falling through if you've got lots of varroa in your hive. And, you, and uh, so it's useful for, for those two pests. Well, here's one on our, our project actually, the Billions of Blossoms, um, asking all the trees that we've been planting, are they worldwide or just in Australia? They are worldwide. So our, our policy here with our project is to do really high quality restoration so we've put a lot of work somebody's been working full-time to form partnerships with organizations around the world who are going to do the best job of planting and looking after their trees because there is a lot of tree planting in the world that isn't being done so well because we need to plant a lot of trees it's it's really taking off as a good thing to do but of course what you want is a forest which has biodiversity so you need to work with organizations that are focused on creating a biodiverse ecosystem. So what we've done here is support the local crew right here on the Wilson River, planting our riverbanks and making sure we're, we're um, planting high quality rainforest along those streams. And then we're nationally here in Australia and then we're internationally uh, all around the world. So because we have customers all around the world, we think it's fair to then plant trees all around the world. Of course, you can plant more in some countries than others, so you've got to weigh up those factors as well. So is, is, is it all right running two brood boxes on a flow hive super? Two brood boxes? Oh, sorry, on a flow hive? Yes, you can add a second brood box, and you can do that just by putting it either on top or below. If you're doing naturally drawn comb, then I would put it below because the bees will tend to hang down and draw much straighter comb than if you put a whole lot of empty frames straight on top of the brood box. So a little tip there if you're adding a second brood box, something that people really like to do in those colder areas where they, the honey season is compressed into a smaller amount of time and the bees really breed up really quickly and they might need more area to do so. And they'll also store quite a lot of honey on the edges of your second brood box too, which will be useful for the winter ahead if you're in a cold climate. Samuel said put the super on the beehive, but since adding the super has noticed now that the bees have pretty much filled the brood box with honey. Is there any reason they might do this? Okay, so if the bees have got a lot of honey down here, first of all check whether you've still got a brood nest in the middle. So we had a look earlier 
and we noticed that they had brood in the frames. So we're happy that this hive has a queen, a laying queen, and it's functioning uh, correctly. Now, if you've got a lot of honey down the bottom here, then what your bees will do after some time, if once you put the super on, is they'll actually move it up to the top. So it's a good thing, as long as you've still got a functioning brood nest, the bees will clear out some space to, to get some more area for the queen to lay by moving honey up to the top. If you want to speed up that process, you can cut some comb out to make more real estate in the bottom. So you could uh, do what's called a spring management where you're simply cutting out some of the honey, which is usually on the edges, and then putting that frame towards the middle of the hive and they can redraw the comb, get some more uh, area for the queen to lay. Fantastic. Cedar, can you harvest royal jelly from a flow hive? Royal jelly is something they secrete. It's a bit like mother's milk and they feed that to the young larvae. They'll feed that to a young worker bee larvae and for the first three days and then they'll switch to bee bread. But they'll feed it all the way through the gestation of a queen. So a queen doesn't get fed bee bread through epigenetics. They uh, somehow, as soon as they're fed plant proteins, they turn into a worker bee. If they're fed royal jelly all the way, they'll be a queen, super-sized with bigger legs. So collecting royal jelly, I'm not 100% sure how that happens. If you know, chime in below and let us know how one would collect royal jelly. Great. Seeds, um, Kerry's from Perth and has the classic hive. And just wondering, what's a good way to do pest management? Um, on the classic hive and also same kind of question as if I've got a classic hive could I buy the base and pest management tray to add to my classic hive? You can just phone up Trace and she'll be very helpful <laughs> in, in uh, sorting you out with what you need. <laughs> and if you don't buy the base and stand um, we've got information haven't we on how to make that cloth in the classic on the core flute slider. Yes you can make a beetle trap using the underside of those cheap tablecloths or some similar fabric that has the vinyl on one side and a fluff on the other. Somewhere we've got a video where you can stick that using a lot of double-sided tape to your core flute, put it in the bottom slot and you'll find some beetles that get their legs tangled in the fluff and it can be a nice beetle trap. <laughs> Anthony's wondering, can you inspect your brood box too much? Uh, no, it's a fantastic thing to get into your hive and really uh, look at what the brood box is doing. Like if you're really getting fascinated with it, which often beekeepers do, it's a, it's a great thing. Get in there, pull out the brood frames, have a look what's going in, stare in at the amazing world of bees. And it, for, for many people that becomes so fascinating. It becomes more about working their bees than harvesting honey. Caveat on that is if it's really cold, then just don't leave the brood frames out of the hive for too long because you don't want to get a cold shock to the uncapped larvae. Once the larvae is capped, you've got capped brood, they can be out of the hive for a long time, but it's the young ones that can suffer from the cold. The bees are clever enough to disconnect their wing muscles and vibrate to warm up the hive and keep this at about 35 degrees, so just below our body temperature, in order to make those young larvae warm enough to survive. Great, Jeff's in southeast Queensland, just up the road, and wondering, is it too late to take a split this time of the year? No, if you've got bulging bees, you can take a split just about any time of year in Queensland especially if you're on the coast where you've got a lot of forage through winter as well. So it's all about what's happening ahead and my guess is that you have plenty of things flowering right through autumn and even into the winter in your location. So you can go ahead and when you've got a lot of bees uh, in your hive, you can go ahead and take a, a split. Fantastic thing to do.
fantastic seeds. With the super that you've added on, how long do you think it's going to take before the bees will maybe start putting some honey in there? That's a great question. So right now we have jibs and drabs of honey flows. Our summertime tends to be a little bit up and down. You get a little bit and then not much, a little bit and not much. A lot in the early spring, not a consistent flow in the summer in our location. So here, I'm not expecting them to fill up this hive very quickly. However, if it was the springtime, they may fill this in as quickly as two weeks, totally full of honey, ready to harvest. And we've seen that a number of times. Conversely, you may get a poor season. Perhaps there was fire, perhaps there was flood. For whatever reason, the hive didn't store excess honey for you to share. And in that case, you might not get any honey in a season. And uh, I find it's always good to have multiple hives because sometimes one hive is just not so virile, not as many eggs are being laid by the queen and it might not do so well in terms of honey storage. So always good to have a couple of hives, you'll find one might be better at foraging and building up than the other. Fantastic, see a lot of questions um, today on hive beetles and another one's coming in um, asking, if, if you're feeling like the oil's not working and the beetles you've maybe um, have, hadn't checked it quick enough, What's the best thing there to get rid of the hive beetles? Oh, there's one, look at it. There we go, there's a hive beetle. Now, that's what they look like. There's sort of oval in shaped, shiny little beetle. You'll see lots of them in your compost heap. They came to Australia about 25 years ago or so, and they are everywhere here and in many countries. But sorry, you didn't mean to be in the wrong spot in the world, but you need to protect your bees from them sometimes. So uh, we find the oil tray works quite well in the bottom at catching beetles. We've probably got a few more now. Um, let's have a look. There's there's uh, a, a few more beetles in, a, in our tray now already. There's another one. And uh, we find it's very good for catching hive beetles. If the oil's not working, try detergent and water if you're in a warm climate and um, that's all we seem to need to do to really curb the beetles. Having said that, there's a few things you need to do in the, when you're keeping bees to make sure you don't um, accidentally arrange things in such a way that the beetles will take over. And that is when you're doing your brood inspections, make sure you don't push comb together. If the comb is being pushed together, perhaps you've muddled frames around, you've got honeycomb and honeycomb pressing against each other, the bees cannot service that area. The beetles will be opportunistic to dive in there and lay their eggs and you can have a quite healthy colony get attacked by beetles and it can be the death of that colony simply by accidentally pressing comb together inside the hive. So a little tip there when you're doing your brood inspections. Nice. So is it possible to make specific honey types like Manuka you were talking about or do bees just prefer to collect where they prefer to go? You can never guarantee a 100% monofloral source. The bees will go and forage on whatever is around. So when you see that is Manuka honey or you see that is ironbark honey or that is bluegum honey, that's the beekeeper's best guess that that's what they were mainly foraging on at the time. And beekeepers, the commercial ones, will be taking their hives to the location of where there's a big flowering. And that's how they know that it's mostly that type of honey. Fantastic, because I know um, in Victoria there were lavender farms and they don't have lavender honey and I oh, don't know, maybe yes. just mixed them with other things as when well. I, when I was driving around your home area, Trace, I was tasting the lavender honey. It's a gorgeous honey. <laughs> <laughs> they, the bees love the lavender. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's with the super that you've put on now um, and you've closed all the cells off, is there anything else you need to do to encourage the bees? Okay, well the only thing, nothing you need to do, the recipe really is wait for the bees to be a lot in the window here, they've built up enough, they need the extra space, they're moving up into this area and when that coincides with a great nectar flow, it'll happen quite quickly. Patience is one of the, the biggest keys. However, if you want to 
do a, a little trick to get some action more quickly, then you can do what we showed you earlier, scrape some wax off the uh, top of the flow frames. If they are ready for a super, there'll be wax getting built up like this, and then you're just putting it into the flow frame surface. I'll give you another demo of how that's done. You just pop the frame, do it in the window so you can enjoy watching it, and you won't harm the frame, just mash it in like that. And uh, when you pop that back down again, you'll have wax on that frame, and you can enjoy watching them recycle it in that area. You'll get them going a bit quicker on your flow frames, but no honey will get stored until there's a great nectar flow and you've got lots of bees in your top box. Great. Um, look, see, the hive beetle is the tune of the day. Robert wants to know, do the bees attack or kill the beetles that they find? No, unfortunately. You do get odd genetics which are really favourable where the bees will grab them and roll them and, and entomb them in little propolis cages and things. But generally they just chase them around. As long as they can keep chasing them around, they can't stop to lay. So they corral them into corners and that's why sometimes you'll find you take off the cover and there'll be a whole lot of beetles here because they've been uh, pushing them all out through the gaps and they'll push them down the screen uh, into the oil tray as well. So unfortunately the bees can't kill the hive beetle but they can chase them around and that's why we have the pest management tray down the bottom to catch those beetles with oil or detergent water. And, and on that topic again, the hive beetle, um, is the slime out a result of having too many beetles in your hive? Yes, it gets called a slime out when the hive beetles take over and your hive becomes a hive beetle nest instead of a beehive. If you get too many eggs laid, hive beetles are capable of laying thousands of eggs. And if the bees haven't stopped them from doing that, then you'll get all of these maggots emerging and crawling around into your comb, damaging the brood. And uh, one sign of that is what we saw earlier, actually, is you get uh, young brood that's damaged being ejected from the hive. And I actually saw that uh, down the front here on the ground. Uh, here we go. So hive beetle attack when it gets hot and humid like we are now. So there's some damaged brood. If you see a lot of that at the entrance, then it could be hive beetles that uh, have laid eggs and their maggots have wormed through the comb, damaging the larvae. The bees are clever enough to eject that larvae because it's been partly damaged by the hive beetle maggots. Great idea to activate your pest management tray and catch those beetles before it's too late. Fantastic. Where do hive beetles live, Cedar? Like so they lay eggs actually uh, in your beehive, which is not ideal, um, or in a compost heap, or uh, anywhere around that's a, a nice warm place with food for larvae to feed on. And what will happen in a hive is when the larvae worms its way out, it'll fall down to the ground and the, the uh, the, the hive beetle larvae, or let's call them maggots to differentiate from the bee larvae, will go into the ground, they'll gestate in the ground and emerge as a beetle. And then they'll, they'll often fly off and they can fly for kilometres in search of compost heaps or beehives or whatever is going to be their next uh, meal. So uh, that's, th that's uh, why activating this oil trap is a good idea you're not only catching beetles but you'll also catch some of the high beetle maggots in the tray as well which is helpful because they don't get into the ground and become more hive beetles nice seeds what other species of bees can you keep in a flow hive so apis mellifera is the european honeybee that humans have taken all around the world wherever they go because they're just such incredible pollinators and they make, make an extraordinary amount of honey. So Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, can pollinate 50 million flowers in a day. A hive like this could visit 50 million flowers. It's absolutely incredible. And they can fill a whole super of honey in a couple of weeks when the flow's on. 
it's, there's no other species like it. However, there is variants that they've successfully had uh, the flow frames work with Apis serrana, um, with, uh, with the Japanese honeybee, also with the Cape honeybee in South Africa. And uh, what you're probably meaning by your question is different breeds of bees. So yeah. beekeepers will breed bees and they'll be still Apis mellifera, but they'll call them a Carnolian or a Caucasian or an Italian bee. And any of them will work. They're all Apis mellifera. So when you look into your hive, your hive will often be a mix of different bees. If we, if we take this box off, you'll see that some of the bees are darker, some are lighter. The ones that are light are called the Italian bees. So you, you'll get these golden colours, the golden Italian bee, and then you'll often get darker ones. And that's simply because the queen would have mated with up to 60 or so drones. And she'll come back to the hive with sperm that could last six years of laying, but those drones will be from all different hives, some Caucasians, some Italians, some Carnolians, and so on. So you get a mixture of temperaments in your hive. So you've got one there that's got a lot more dark on its abdomen, and then you've got another one here which is very light, just to sh show that the variations in genetics in your hive. Oh, thanks, Seth. Just wondering what finish you've put on the super. So this one's actually an oil. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're undercover. We used to use the oils in the very beginning, and what we found is they do attract uh, mildew after a while. The mildew, which doesn't affect your hive, it just looks unsightly, will feed on the oils after some time. So unless you want to be re really rigorous and uh, you know ev every other month you're recoating, then you're probably better off using the outdoor decking products because they're made to keep wood looking like wood outdoors for as long as possible. And that way you'll get some years out of your coat before needing attention rather than months. Right. So do flow hives easy enough for the fir for first time users? Absolutely. About half of our beekeepers are brand new to beekeeping and the other half has kept bees before. So since the very beginning, we realized that our invention had really inspired a lot of people to start beekeeping for the first time. So what we did is we started creating training material and also being here every week to answer your questions. So we've put out thousands of hours of training on how to keep bees and how to use your flow hive. And keeping a flow hive is actually an easier start than many other beehives because we have extra features built in like a uh, pest management tray, you've got adjustable legs to, to adjust it, you've got levels in the side and the harvesting process is just so much easier instead of having to buy an extractor and set up an extracting room in your garage and buy the hot knife and all the buckets and sieves and, and uh, benches you'll need to, to create your extracting room. It's all done right here in the hive. This is as big as your footprint needs to be and you can harvest honey just easily and enjoy that process with your family right at the back of the hive. So it's certainly less of a learning curve than the conventional extracting setup and so much easier. Right, so this is, I had a call yesterday actually from somebody and um, one of our bee customers and they'd seen like you can get these smaller hives that you can, because often the question we're asked is I want the smallest hive you've got um, and just wondering, are different types of bees use the small hives, like the smaller frames that, 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 that a customer had seen on the market and it was like a much smaller sized hive, but are they different bees? Are they so the Japanese honeybee, is a variant and it is smaller. It's an Asian honeybee and it does use a smaller size frame. So you can reduce the size of your flow frame to suit those tiny hives. But it's like very, very unusual to do that. So this is as small as you can go with a beehive with the European honeybee Apis mellifera. You don't want to go any smaller than this. 
and that's just because otherwise they will half of them will take off looking for a new home because their home isn't big enough. That makes sense. How did how did uh, who, how did they work that out that this is the size? That it was so. <laughs> that this is the right size. <laughs> oh well, uh, you know you can study nature and see how big beehives are and make sure you've got enough room. And then humans have been keeping bees for the more than a hundred years like this. So we know that if we make the hive too small, the bees will be swarming often. Fantastic. How many bees are in a hive? So it varies. So here we have a, about 15,000 bees in a box at a guess, but a colony in full flight might have up to 50,000 bees. So it's absolutely incredible. And we've done measurements to, to count the bees at the front and notice that 70,000 bees might go in and out foraging in a day from this very hive here. So it's incredible to, to just fathom those numbers because if you add up all of that flight, it's several times around the world in a day. And if you add up all of the flowers a hive like this can pollinate, it's 50 million flowers pollinated in a day. It's just extraordinary. There's no other insect or anything that can do this for us in terms of pollinating our food chain. So very important that we have enough bees, very important that we have enough beekeepers to look after our bees. Right. And tips and tricks, always beginner beekeepers are saying, what is the best way to get started? Best way to get started it depends on what type of learner you are. I'm the type of person who just likes to jump in and learn as you go. Life is an adventure and I just like to get what I'm interested in and get going. And I'm the type of person that likes to watch videos online. If you're that type of person, have a look at thebeekeeper.org, which is an online training course with experts from all over the world, made to take you from square one right through to a deep scientific knowledge. Free to try and an amazing fundraiser. We have planted 150 million trees in high quality ecosystems now around the globe, so we're very excited about that. If you're the type of person who likes to read a lot, then we do have some recommended reading on our website. If you want to um, do a hands-on beekeeping course, then you might like to check locally and do a hands-on beekeeping course. But the most important thing is you get started. So whatever it takes, and I'd recommend just getting your equipment, sourcing your bees and getting started. Fantastic. And with the, Vanessa's asking, with the beekeeper.org, if you've done the modules, do you do we keep updating the modules that we put on the beekeeper.org? Yes, at the moment we've got a couple of years of content there. So it's an ongoing learning journey, that one. And we will keep producing content as well. So there's a lot there to learn from. Amazing, uh, amazing teachers from around the world who are experts in their field teaching you about all things beekeeping. Is it all right if you get a small amount of water cedar into the pest management tray and should you just empty it out? Yes, perfectly normal. If you've got driving rain, it has to get pushed into the entrance and it'll just simply go through the screen and down into your tray. After you've had a big rain event, just uh, take a moment to empty out the tray of your hive. Now I'm lighting this smoker up again because I've been chin wagging too long and it's <laughs> gone out. I'm going to use this uh, blowtorch here and try not to burn my hive. <laughs> and uh, if I just give that a puff, here's an example of how not to light a smoker. <laughs> so um, you really want the flame to be at the bottom and I, I lit it sort of at the top there. If I, if I pick it up again, like the bottom, like that, and then I give it a puff, then now it's going, look at that. So it's normal, you don't always get it right, lighting your smoker, but what you mainly want to focus on is getting that first ignition and burn. You don't want to stuff it full straight up or it'll go out. So there it is, I'm giving it a few puffs just to get it going. Now once it's really going, you can see flames coming out. 
then you can start stuffing some more in there. And what that'll do is just extend your time to use the smoker. We're going to wrap up this hive now and put it all back together. Thanks very much for all your questions. We've got time, time for a couple more as we do that. I just wanted a little bit of smoke here in order to get these bees to go back in. Smoke's a wonderful tool. Watch these bees here, they're all around the edge. If I just gently puff some smoke on, they'll get out of the way. So to me, even though smoke in your face wouldn't be that fun, getting squashed is worse. And uh, it is a really useful tool just to move bees while you're working so you don't squash any. So what I'm gonna do is put that Flow Hive Super on, which is the theme of today. We showed you how to prepare your super. Now you might want your bee brush at this point just to brush the last bees away. After adding a bit of smoke, you can see a lot of bees have cleared off the top now, which is helpful. And the bee brush is here, and I can just sweep some last ones off the edge and seize the moment to put that super on. Of course, we can't always get it right, but we can try to get the the box on without uh, the bees getting squashed between the super edge and here. You can also put it on partly like that and just roll it down, making sure that those bees are out of the way like that. And good, our super is on and their roof goes on like this. Again, making sure we're not squashing any bees around the rim, your inner cover on top. And then on top of that goes our gabled roof, which you want the cutout bit at the back because that gives you access to the honey harvesting area where the key goes. And there we have it. Your hive has your super on. You'll notice the bees are starting to come up already. Have a look here. We've already got some working that wax we put in here, so that was a fun little experiment to do. And that'll just get your bees started a bit earlier, chewing away at the wax and recycling it around. And you can enjoy watching that. You won't get honey stores until you've got a lot of bees in the hive and a good nectar flow, but it's very exciting when the honey starts to pour in. Thank you very much for watching. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next.